Thank you, David. I'm now pleased to introduce to you Guido Oppenzeller. Uh, Guido also got his PhD in this program at Stanford. Uh, he is the one who produced OpenFlow 1.0, which is the widely, most widely implemented version of OpenFlow. Um, got his PhD with Nick. Previously, he was uh, CTO at Voltage uh, Security. Uh, he is now CEO of Big Switch Networks. So he's always been an innovator. It's like, it's like this is the direction I want to go. I'm going there. Don't stop me. Um, and as a uh, CEO of a company that spends a lot of time with a variety of, of customers, um, he brings a, a very hands-on, tangible perspective on what will sell, what needs they can actually solve from enterprise users. So please welcome Guido Oppenzeller. Super. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, you forgot to mention, it actually turns out I'm not SDN certified, so. <laughs> um, so at Big Switch Networks, we're essentially building a platform um, that allows enterprises to use SDN in their networks. And uh, one of our key value propositions is that without that, we can virtualize your network. So what I want to do is share some thoughts uh, and some experiences um, from, from our interaction with customers on, on what it means to virtualize networks and then what we've learned. So, so currently in the data center, um, there's a lot of change going on. Um, and uh, this is a very busy slide here, and I think you've seen many of the, the major topics in other slides already today. But um, the, 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 big, the biggest trend of all, and, and this is old news, is uh, server virtualization. It has completely changed the OPEX calculus um, on the compute side, um, but it's now bleeding over on the network, to the networking side. Uh, just to give some sample statistics here, um, this is from a financial institution that, that I recently talked to. You know, in their case, about 35% of all servers are virtualized. Uh, they hope to get that over 50% uh, in, in within three years. Of the new servers that are coming online, over 60% are already virtualized. So we're looking sort of at a, at a mixed environment, but, but uh, virtualization is definitely the trend. Um, the, the networking, uh, the, the part of what virtualization um, does is that the network is now split over switches um, that are living in the hypervisor, hypervisor switches like vSwitch from VMware or Open vSwitch, um, and the physical switches, which makes management of your network a lot more challenging because suddenly, you have, usually, these two are not integrated. You have to manage them through different um, mechanisms. Um, another major change is that the application teams that roll out applications uh, in your data center, they're no longer uh, you know, one, one machine that's just connected to the network, but they basically want to shape how their network looks like. You might have a multi-tier application you know, with firewalls in between. And that makes things much, much harder because suddenly, you know, the, the central networking department has to reconfigure the network every time a couple of new virtual machines are coming online. And, and last but not least, there's this trend towards uh, private clouds, which means, uh, you know, you want a, a more of a self-service infrastructure where basically an employee can go to a portal, uh, reserve uh, a couple of servers and the network in between them, and, uh, and, and configure that without even uh, human intervention. Uh, so some other trends, the traffic patterns have changed. It used to be all north-south, meaning from the, from the servers uh, to the gateway. Um, uh, it's more and more east-west, meaning between servers because of multi-tier applications, Hadoop clusters, and these kind of things. And then we're also seeing scale changes. And there's not so much scale in terms of bandwidth. I mean, bandwidth is going up, no question. But it's, it's scale in terms of, uh, as, as Ken pointed out earlier, suddenly I have you know, a very large number of MAC addresses, or you know, I, have, uh, more, I have more tenants than I have VLANs, so we're seeing exhaustion issues uh, in those areas. So what does it mean for the network? Um, on the network side, um, I have virtualized server infrastructure, and I want virtualized networking infrastructure. It's sort of the higher order of it. The, once I have that, I would like to delegate this out. Um, I want APIs so I can automate it. I don't want to do everything manually if I can avoid it. Um, I would like to have one controller management plane to do to manage both the hypervisor and the and the physical network. Yeah. Um, and I would cope with like more complex topologies, and uh, you know I want to have broadcast domain isolation. This is just a laundry list. And if you so if you might be wondering, okay, that's a nice set of requirements. Do I really need this? What happens if I just ignore this and try to do things the way um, that I've been doing so far? Um, so we did a sort of mini survey of a, a couple of our customers and asked them, if you're going from a classic, classical colo model with you know, physical service to a private cloud where you have complete self-provisioning, um, what's the effect on the number of change requests that come into your networking uh, department if you, if you don't change anything? And the answer is it goes up by a fairly large factor. So if you're, if you're trying to scale this, right, the, the number of VMs that are being, being started up in the enterprise is going up and up and up, you either have to hire more and more and more network administrators or you have to do something different. And that's sort of our network virtualization. <coughs> now, 
let me define what network virtualization is. Um, this is a quote from Packet Push's blog, which, which I think is great. I mean, at this point, you know, virtual networking is, is very, very widely used and means different things to different people. Uh, when we talk about virtualization, network virtualization, what we're thinking of is basically you have a simple architecture, uh, network architecture. You know, you have a routed core. You have this aggregation in the top of rack layer, like hypervisor switches here to somewhere. And uh, so in this, in this topology, we have different applications. So I have a blue application here, a green application, and a red application. And they all have certain servers. They might be physical. They might be VMs. So what, what I want to do with network virtualization is I want to take you know, the servers of one application, basically map them to a, thing, to a virtual switch you know, or a virtual network. Uh, we like to just think of this virtual thing as one switch because it makes things very, very simple and intuitive. And uh, you know, do the same, the same uh, with the other applications. And then I'm going to go ahead and take the switch and delegate it out uh, to the, the team that runs the application. So I, as the network, as my, the, the person in the network team, don't have to worry about it anymore. So this is the goal we're trying to achieve. Doing network virtualization is very, very hard if you try it in a fully distributed way. So if you do the, the separate switches where every switch runs on its own software. Just think about, you know, if I remove or add a tenant, does you have to update every switch? If, you know, if VMs move around, how would I notice, you know, how, how would I configure them? Um, if you look at sort of how sort of the, the, the classic non-SDN virtualization mechanisms that we have, uh, they pretty much always require additional information to be tagged onto the packet. Right? So it's not like a VLAN tag to, to separate traffic in MPLS. Um, and even outside so the typical SDN, um, there are actually some, some centralized controllers that are creeping in uh, to the way we run networks. So for example, VMware's distributed vSwitch effectively has a centralized controller. Same with the Nexus 1000 d effectively has a centralized controller that manages a couple of the, the actual kernel modules um, that go to the hypervisors. So, so I think the, we're, what we've learned is that SDN is a fantastic approach for building network virtualization. So another huge advantage of SDN is that it makes it much, much easier to integrate your other applications with your network. Uh, so imagine you want to build a private cloud. Uh, what you really like to get to is to have a single console that allows you to configure both your compute uh, and your network, and uh, provision everything from there. Um, and you want to automate that as much as possible just to reduce the overhead. So if you're doing this with busy lots of separate switches, let's just you want to do something very simple, like attaching an echo to a virtual machine. This is pretty hard. I mean, you know, if you're lucky, you somewhere have a central database where you could query which switch is this particular host connected to. Um, then you can visibly fetch that information, connect to that particular switch, echo it on the switch. But then this virtual machine might get moved around by the hypervisor somewhere else, and you basically have to redo all of that and then have to reconnect to it. Um, if you're having a controller platform in between, you basically just go to the controller platform, say the controller platform, here's a MAC address and here's an echo list, map the MAC address to the MAC, uh, to the MAC address. Uh, and you're done. You don't have to think about it anymore. If the virtual machine moves, the platform will take care of you for it. And that's just a simple case, right? There's, there's more complex ones. Like, for example, I want to ask the question, how much bandwidth do I have between host A and host B right now? Right? It's a very, very difficult question in a distributed network. Uh, or, you know, think about rollback mechanisms. So I'm trying to do a couple of changes, and if, I, if one of them fails, I want to roll back to the previous state, right? Again, if I have lots of distributed switches, very, very difficult to do. Much, much easier with SDN. So another key thing that we're seeing is the, the capability to delegate. Um, if, if I'm an architect, I want to think about the network in a certain way. Right? I want to see everything, I want to know what's happening physically, I want to see all the switches. Um, the team administrator who's worrying about a particular application wants to have a very different view. So, so if our model is, is, is a model where basically the network architect can say, I pick a couple of end hosts, I map them to what we call a virtual switch, and then you can delegate out that virtual switch, but the actual day-to-day -day administration of this virtual network can be done by somebody else who has only very, very limited privileges, and who is in a sandbox. You can only change things um, on this particular network. The key value proposition that comes out from all of that is basically a, 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 a big reduction in the overhead that it takes to, to manage your network. So I talked to, to one um, uh, CIO of a, of a medical center who basically said every time uh, he's spinning up a new virtual machine in his data center, you know, which takes 30 minutes or so, uh, all overhead included, it takes about a network administrator about two, uh, two days to re echo all the switches in the network <coughs> to basically get everything back into compliance. Right? You know, so, HIPAA compliance, you know, a couple of other compliance regulations that they have. And we have a solution like this, I think you can drastically, uh, drastically reduce that. So, another thing that we learned is um, there's very different approaches in terms of how you actually do the software defined network. So we have a centralized controller. We have a network. So in this case, we have uh, you know, a fairly simple network. It's basically a couple of virtualized servers, two physical servers. We have top of rack switches. We have some spine aggregation switches on top. You know, if you 
have a more traditional model, you might just have one switch up there. You know, in the more modern architectures, you have a couple of them. And, um, and now I want to do SDN. How, how can I do this? So there's a couple of places where you can, play, where you can basically enable SDN. So one approach is to say, let's just enable SDN in the, the hypervisor switches. So take OpenB switch, um, you know, connect it to your controller. Um, in this case, you do most things with tunneling. So basically, if, if one host wants to talk to another host, you set up a tunnel between the two. You can do these stateless, so they're, they're pretty efficient. And um, you, you just tunnel over uh, the infrastructure, uh, and that's, that's about you. And it's actually pretty attractive, because it means you don't have to change anything about the network. Right? Your classical physical network you can run the same configuration that, that you run before. Um, the, the downside with this is, and, and there's actually some markets where I think this works great, right? If you have a completely homogeneous infrastructure, um, you know, it's, it's something that's worth looking at. Um, in the enterprise, the problem with that is, first of all, what do I do with physical servers, right? Um, I, I somehow need a way to terminate those tunnels so I can still tie the physical service into my virtual topologies um, that I'm creating. Um, but there's other problems. For example, if I have this kind of tunneling on the hypervisor approach, uh, I send <coughs> a packet on a hypervisor and it doesn't come out on the other side, then, then what do I do? Right? It's, it's very, very hard to debug these things. Uh, I can basically go to a different management console, and try to debug the network, and try to replicate what's happening. Um, but it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, to build this in. Uh, you know, similar things if I have a QoS problem. Right? I'm seeing long, large packet delay, one packet being sent out by a hypervisor switch to, to another hypervisor switch. It's very, it's very hard for me to tell what is causing this or, or what, what the reason is um, for this to happen. So in the enterprise, it, it may work, um, but th there's cases where it doesn't work. Um, what tends to work a lot better is if you're basically taking a combination of hypervisor switches and top of rank switches. So in this case, you have uh, your hypervisor switches are enabled with some kind of software-defined networking protocol, your top of rank switches, so physical switches are enabled, software-defined networking. This gives you a couple of additional degrees of freedom. So first of all, um, you, know, the, you can now choose do you want to tunnel or not, because in, in this case, you actually don't have to tunnel. It's still an option, but instead you can, for example, uh, just use the, the top of rack switches to, to distribute the traffic over the, the next layer above and, and filter it back down. Um, and, and second thing is it gives a lot more visibility in what's happening in your network. You know, the, the top of rack switches are not under your control. You can see delays. You can you know, send probing packets. So it's, uh, you tend to know a lot better what's going on. Last but not least, your physical servers now are trivial and to integrate. Right? They, you can just add them to a virtual network the same way um, as you would have done it uh, before. So then, one, one very last comment. There was, I think, a lot of, it seems like a lot of discussion about OpenFlow versus SDN uh, here, here at the, the conference. And to me, that's just uh, the wrong question. So um, what I have here to the to line is an image of a switch, the, the way we look at it. Uh, so if a switch for us has you know, a number of different tools we can use in order to build an SDN solution. Um, you know, you have OpenFlow is one of them. Um, there's other methods, uh, and it could be vendor extensions, it could be things we can do via SNMP, uh, you know, in some cases, um, potentially going into the shell directly. Um, but you know, the, the, at the end of the day, um, you know, any good, I think, SDN solution that you'll find out there will probably use any tool that's at their disposition and, uh, and you know, to, together in order to, to, to build uh, uh, networks. The, the one caveat here is standards matter. Um, so what we're hearing a lot from our customers is they're worried about vendor lock-in. Right? This is a very early, uh, it's very early uh, stage in the industry. Um, you don't want to go with a solution where it's difficult to switch. And OpenFlow right now is the only protocol that's, that's widely standardized. You know, the owner's obviously on, on Dan here to, to, to change that and uh, you know, um, add, add new things to that, but it's something sort of, you know, that, that we're paying a lot of attention to. As, uh, we think at least in the enterprise it will uh, affect it all. That's all I have. Thank you. This is your chance. No, it's okay. No. <laughs> I assume the glass, the glass big slide with the uh, with the open B switch and, the, and open flow enabled top of rack switches. Uh, you have some experience with this, so the question that I have is how many flow updates per second? Uh, I can imagine you see a number of flow flow updates per second in the aggregate to the open B switches. How many flow up, flow table updates per second or flow uh, is, uh, initiations through the slow path per second you typically see through the top of rack switches? 
So it, it, it varies a lot by vendor, right? I mean, it, it, typically on the top of rack switch, the bottleneck for, for flow uh, updates is, is the you know, CPU or the CPU switching chip that, uh, on bus. No, no, that's the capacity. Of what I'm talking about is, I'm sorry, let me refer, let me sharpen the question. Sure. In use, when you, when, you have, when you deploy these things, what's the demand? I see. Well, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, typically we design our solutions. To, uh, so let, let, me, let me turn the question around, right? The, currently, the, the flow update rate you have on many of the, the commercial switches is effectively what's limiting how dynamic you can, you can, um, your network can be. Right? So, um, so what you do is you basically adjust the granularity at which you manage flows to the update rates that your switches support, right? and to some extent the TCAPs that they have. So what, what this means is, um, you know, in, uh, as a baseline, you would start with something like managing flows at a per megabus granularity, right? or maybe you know, megabus per port, which, which tends to be fairly static. Right? That's, that's something you need to update, not very often. Um, you know, I think what was said previously, the, the, you know, do an update for every single flow, practically speaking, you know, with today's hardware, we're, we're far from that working, right? It's, it's not feasible. We do things that of course are going to allow you. Yeah, but the point is that you can do it that fine in open B switch, right? You're, you're, you're not granularity limited on a, on a software switch that's sitting in the hyper, that's sitting in DOM zero. So the question is, how often do you actually have to bump? Because that's effectively, the top of rack switch has now become the second tier of networking. And so the question is, uh, how often do you have to, uh, I see Bob Lance is there, and maybe he has a comment on this. Uh, so the question is, how often do you actually have to hit those flow tables? Or, and how much can, how much of the control you need can you get just by looking at the software switch and the hypervisor? So, so if you have a hypervisor switch, what you typically do is, I mean, in, in general, right, what you typically do is you have fine granularity at the edge, and then as you move towards the core, uh, you get much, much coarser, right, and which at the end gives you the same result. So the, you know, if you have a hypervisor switch, I would push all the echoing down to the hypervisor switch, and doesn't just do, you know, like a pair of hosts based forwarding at the top of the switch. We might be getting too technical here. <laughs> Rebuttal from the other side of the room? No. <laughs> I think Bob has gone away. Another question? Go ahead. I'm curious, uh, with uh, OpenB switch or other open flow enabled hypervisor switches and uh, the emerging standard that is one QBH, QBG, that uh, a lot of complexity around how to perform virtual machine hypervisor switching. I think my perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm without knowing a lot about it, um, it seems OpenFlow is a simpler way of accomplishing a lot of simple thing, uh, a lot of the, the goals that you're trying to accomplish with those. Do you see them as competitive? Do you see them interoperating? And if so, how? I mean, to, to me, the, the different tools to, to you know ach achieve achieve the same goal, and actually in certain situations, you know, some are advantageous over others. Right? I mean, we're we're using a number of them. Um, the you know, the they all have their strengths and weaknesses. You know. And, and, how much of the network do you want to do in, the, in software? How much of the network do you want to do in hardware? You know, how much physical hardware do you have? You know, something like VXLAN is great as a tunneling technology. So, you know, I, I think they're very complementary. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Guido. Thanks.